prisoner is framed and accused of a serious crime. The sentence is a change of mind. Public enemy number six. If you insist. But public enemies cannot be tolerated indefinitely. I'm inadequate. Disharmonious. Believe me. Believe me. The ultrasonic beam is now focused on the exact link point of the frontal lobes. Now to step up the voltage until the ultrasonic bombardment causes permanent dislocation. At last, a mind free from fear or favor. A mind that will reveal all its secrets. But to whom? Number 86, a report to number two immediately. Repeat immediately. Stupid woman, she'll ruin everything. Don't have a change of mind. Be sure to watch the next exciting episode of The Prisoner. your guide to the wonderful world of the prisoner. Tonight's episode, A Change of Mind, is yet another turning point in the prisoner's relationship with the village. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most important turning points. As we've mentioned before in our reordering of the episodes, the series appears almost as a three-act play. Over the past six weeks, we've seen Act Two, The Battle for the Prisoner's Mind. We've seen the village manipulate his dreams in A, B, and C, manipulate his fantasies in living in harmony, and change his very reality by placing his mind in the body of another person in Do Not Forsake Me. But the keynote of Act Two is stalemate. The prisoner thwarts the village's schemes, but he remains its prisoner for the next round. Tonight, in Change of Mind, however, we get the first scene of Act Three. The village now plots the ultimate assault on the mind of the prisoner, and he, in turn, begins his ultimate revenge. And in addition to raising some important questions about social pressure against dissidents, this episode offers some absolutely delightful performances. After tonight's episode, I'll be back to talk some more about the symbols in the series. So I'll see you then, unless you or I have a change of mind. In the village. What do you want? Information. Whose side are you on? That would be telling. We want information. 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 You won't get it. By hook or by crook, we will. Who are you? The new number two. Who is number one? You are number six. I am not a number. I am a free man. <laughs> Welcome back, my friends, to another episode of Once Upon a Village, a prisoner podcast. I'm your number two here, John S. Drew. And we're coming into the later end of the episodes. We've only got six more to go here in mm -hmm. our journey. And when I say we, I am also referring to our own number six here, writer, editor, Jim Beard, who's been there from the beginning when we started with Arrival. Hey, Jim. Hey, it's good to be back. It is good to be back here. And talking about one of the better episodes, in my opinion. Hmm. I um, 
I don't know if I want to go so far as to say one of the the best or the the better. You, you know what I was uh, had in mind to say was it was entertaining, right? And uh, I think it's well done. I think it can be held up as a a good snapshot of the of the series overall. But it doesn't it doesn't really break any new ground. And I think that takes it down a few notches for me, but but definitely entertaining. Uh, and there's a, there's a few things about it that I'm actually kind of eager to you know talk about uh, in this. It's interesting you say that. Don't break new ground because I was thinking that too. But yet I like the way the ideas here are presented. Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay, well, as far as ideas, I don't think it breaks any new grounds. Presentation, I think that's uh, yeah. You know, there's there could be an argument. Uh, again, um, completely serviceable. You know, well done, well written, well acted. As as really all the episodes are, and and what I really love about it is directed by our star himself. Yes. Yeah. I, I I did appreciate that. Directed by Patrick McGowan, written by Roger Parks. This was the ninth episode to be produced, but the twelfth aired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So not too far off of you know uh, from the pr- from from the production right. you know, run. Exactly. Yeah. 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 From from now, from what I understand, McGowan was not supposed to have directed this. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of looking into it, and the way I understand it is, is that they had a director, and they did, and someone's going to correct me if I'm wrong. I, they did about a half a day of shooting, and McGowan was not a happy camper, and they got rid of the director, and the next thing that the cast and the crew knew, suddenly McGowan was directing it, hmm. which. If that's true, that's that's called rolling with, you know, things as far as he was able to step in. And, you know, there's a lot of prep work that goes into the direction of even just a TV episode. So if that that was correct, you know, that that's uh, an amazing feat. And I, I like the way this episode is shot. Now, of course, a lot of times, you know, camera movements and camera shots are are due to the cinematographer. But, you know, I believe a lot of that is also the director, too. And I also read some stories about that. He there was some certain ways of shooting and dollies and 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 camera movements and that sort of thing that that came from from him. So uh, I, I give Patrick, you know, high marks. For the direction of this episode. Maybe that's part of the reason I'm finding it so enjoyable, so appealing, is just the, the pacing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to agree with that. Um, it is one of the things that elevates it for me. And, and as we get into it, there's a few other things, too. But uh, And then, incredibly enough, uh, from what I understand, this was the first real... I think they say the real first commissioned w- w- screen work of the writer. Oh. Yeah, like he 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 didn't really have anything much else under his belt or something like that. So I, I think there's a lot of things that could have gone wrong. If it was a poor episode, you know, it's those things that people could have pointed to and go, oh, well, you know. It, it was a sort of a, a newbie director and a newbie writer. What'd you expect? Right. But yeah. actually, I, I think it came together well. And, and I'm going to go back to what I said. I don't think it's a standout from amongst the entire series, but it, I would be very comfortable with saying to someone, "You want a good snapshot of the series? You could do worse. You know, this is this is a, a, a good episode to do it." And John, I got to tell you the other thing. I started watching this the other day, and I had no recollection of it. Me and I've I've watched the series all the way through more than once over the years, and I'm watching this, and, and it's funny. It was almost like watching a new episode, like somebody had found an episode of The Prisoner that no one had ever seen before. Uh, so that in itself was really interesting. I, I got to the end and I just sat there and I thought, wow, I, 
I don't recognize that number two. I don't recognize, you know, different things that go on in the episode. It was familiar as far as the themes were were familiar, you know. But other than that, it, it was kind of fascinating. It, you know, it was like seeing one that I'd never seen before. It's funny you say that because I feel the exact same way. Oh. I did not remember this one at all. Huh. And we'll talk about it some more, but I'll tell you who I really like in this episode is the woman. Yes. 86, right? 86, yep. Yep. Yeah. Because there is another woman, number 42, who's crying at the beginning of this. Yeah, yes. No, (laughs) no, I wasn't real fond of her. No, it's 86 that that I liked a lot. And and I don't know if you noticed, you know who gets a lot of FaceTime in this episode? Angelo. Yes. Yeah. He really does. Um, almost like like he was almost important to the story. Like he was actually doing things that were part of the story, other than just being a background figure. Right. You know, so that that in, in itself was was very interesting. Now I had to wonder though, because we both seem to have this thing about not remembering and yet it's memorable enough because if I'm not mistaken, isn't there one of the prisoner societies called the unmutual society, which is a term they use throughout the episode. Oh, that, you know, (laughs) I don't know that, but if that's true, then that's, that's very fun. Um, I had someone very close to me who used to say that all the time. Um, she would say, you, Jokingly, you're being. Or she'd say you were either unmutual or non-mutual. <laughs> so it's interesting because she was a big prisoner fan. So I'm wondering if she, she maybe remembered this episode more more than I did. You know, it's funny is is that I go, you say, oh, watch a change of mind, and I thought, oh, this is the one that McGowan is barely in. You know, it's it's the you know it's the one where he's a different you know it's a different actor. Oh, that's yeah. next episode. Okay, well, that was funny. So it starts, and I'm going, hmm, McGowan's in this a lot. Hmm, <laughs> wait a minute, he hasn't disappeared yet, huh? <laughs> and that's that's what, and then it really confused me. Like, what episode is this? Who who's that number two? What? <laughs> it and it's funny too because uh, a friend of mine, a writer by the name of Will Hagcroft, uh, wrote a book called The Feelings Unmutual. It was basically his journey to discover, then self-diagnose, and then have confirmed the fact oh. that he is autistic. But he did oh, okay. it in his fifties, huh? Yeah. So you know, Very just interesting. Yeah, and just that that whole th- idea that of unmutuality and then autism with yeah. you know the difficulties sometimes to socially connect. Yeah, uh, I thought was interesting there. One of the other things that was said when I was looking through my different books about it is 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 one of the, one of the opinions put forth is that that this could be seen as one of the most pessimistic of of the episodes too, and I thought that was a really um, interesting take on it. I could see that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Yeah. Now, the, the episode itself aired December 15th, 1967 in the UK, August 24th, 1968 in the United States. And again, you know, we're talking about what we remember, what we don't remember. Did we see the prisoners workout area before in a previous episode? I, yes, I believe that's correct. Cause okay. that did seem f- familiar to me. Good. And we've also seen him approached by uh, a couple of, of thugs, right. And right. he gets into a scrap with them. That, that in itself is nothing new. The one thing I think that kind of makes that this sequence stand out, and I kind of laugh to myself, is that in the past of the episodes that we watch, they they've always been very obviously stuntmen who who pick on him and attack him, and it was, it's always so obvious because they can't act. <laughs> but I was really kind of amazed that these two these two guys were were acting 
and and they were good. It wasn't like you know, like someone who's a stunt person and not not necessarily an actor who's tr- you know they give up some lines to and they read it very woodenly because they're not experienced in acting. But these guys were doing fine. You know, they were jerks and, and all, and they were they were doing a good job at it. And and then they start going into the action bits, and it it doesn't look like they were replaced by stunt people for the action scenes although mcguin was when it really gets into where he has to do and when he's doing the swinging on the bars and everything it's obviously not mcguin you know in the far shots but again i thought that was very interesting that if these guys were stuntmen they were also pretty good actors and we we don't really get that in this series it's funny you say that because that was where I was going to surprise you. I didn't know if you caught it or not. One of the two men uh-huh. uh, appeared as a regular on a show you recently did a watch through and have become very interested in UFO. Uh oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, uh, the, which one? The the darker one? I think it's the dark. I, I'm not sure. His his name, the actor's name is Michael Billington, who played Colonel Paul Foster. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, you mean one of those guys was Paul Foster from UFO? Yes. Boy, do I feel stupid. <laughs> okay, in my defense, this was from 67, this episode? Yes. UFOs from 1970. Right. So he was he was roughly three years younger. <laughs> I'm gonna. Okay. So he's the he's the fairer of of the two guys. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's really interesting because he is an actor, but he actually did you know some action scenes in UFO, he fighting and things like Okay, well, you know what? He was in all around. And it's funny because I don't like the character of Paul Foster in <laughs> UFO. Because <laughs> you know why? He was always put forth as the lead and you'd always have his his shirts like unzipped, you know, and everything. And it's like, oh, he's he's beef, just beefcake there for for the female viewers. <laughs> and you know, I he was being foisted on us and too much in UFO. But all oh, right, wow, thank you so much for telling me that. Oh, that is welcome. really interesting. Really, really interesting. That's that's going to be our UFO watch now for you. Well, <laughs> oh well, that's a discussion for another time, but. It had crossed my mind because <laughs> I've become quite a UFO fan. Now. I know. I've seen I've seen your posts on Facebook. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so here's the thing though, he's attacked by these guys because he refuses to use the gym in the village. He's got his little special workout area here and of yeah. course they you know, they mock him, they tease him and stuff, and the fight begins, and of course he kicks the you know, he kicks the crap out of them, so to speak, there. Good. But they, they go off it. with their tail tucked between their legs saying, You'll face the committee for this. <laughs> I had to wonder about that. The committee? Has that been mentioned before? N- not not this committee. And that's the, that's the funny thing. You know, it, it's... And I've had this discussion with a lot of people. It's a time in television when continuity mm-hmm. is not necessarily something that uh, that most shows worried about or you know or bothered with. To some extent, yes, yeah, yes. But there's a lot of over the course of the episodes of the show. There is a lot of different councils, committees, groups organizations and things that that doesn't seem to be a lot of consistency between and it's either that you just sort of roll with that because that's not why you're watching the show you're watching it maybe for the themes or there's a lot of upheaval in in the village i mean we get a different number two almost every single episode and again i go back to this every you see a, a new number two and almost always, number six is already familiar with this number two, and the number two is familiar with number six. So you have to imagine that some time has passed between the previous episode, when there was a different number two, 
and whatever the number two is in this episode. So again, in, when you get one of these councils, committees, or whatever, that that suddenly it seems like they've been there for a while, you have to kind of wonder how much time has supposedly passed. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is is that the focus is more on the committee for a while than on number two. We don't even see number two right away like we often do in so many of these episodes. At You're first... Right. We've got the prisoner being brought before the committee. And I love the whole setup there as he's waiting outside in the corridor outside with other people, I'm assuming, who are also going to be meeting with the committee and stuff. Number 42, this woman is there crying her eyes out, Mm -hmm. I guess, as she's upset about, you know, her time. And they've got the audio of the hearings inside piping out to the hallway um, yeah. Another prisoner, number 93. The council chamber have considered your case, number 93, and already there are signs of disharmony in your behavior. You appear to be a reasonable man, but there is plenty of evidence showing your unwillingness to work for the community. The court has a busy morning, and there are several cases waiting to be dealt with. Number six is seriously in need of help, and we want to do something for 42. She appears to be in a permanent state of depression, always in tears. It is your clear duty, number 93, to prove that you are once again a suitable member of our society. The only way for you now to regain the respect of your fellows is to publicly acknowledge your shortcomings. Go to the rostrum and confess. We will tell you what to say. They're right, of course. They're right, of course. Quite right. Quite right. I'm inadequate. I'm inadequate. 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 Disharmonious. Disharmonious. I'm truly grateful. I'm truly grateful. Believe me. 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 Number six. Enter. No privacy at all, right? Right. Yeah, you know, nothing's private. Um, you know, our 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 number six is as sarcastic as ever. And, oh, yeah. You know, you got to love them, you know, through all this. Because, you know, in so many ways, I uh, he's representing me. Like, I, I, I would be the exact same way. I'd be sitting there just ripping the thing to shreds, you know, like, oh, well, you know, uh, I I don't even know why he bothered to go there, uh, other than maybe he thought that they'd physically haul him <laughs> over there. But there's a little bit of tension in that scene because you have that apprehension of you're next, you know, to mm-hmm. go in before the, these people. But once, they're, once you're in there, we've already had a thing where he goes before a group and – he's being turned around in a circle. Yes. So, uh, again, it's like, that's one of those things that maybe it's a little unfortunate or, or some people may look at it as, no, that's just the way things are done in the village. But it's like, we've already kind of seen that. What I don't really care for is that he, you can tell it's starting to impact number six. And I don't, understand really why and as this goes along it's it looks like it starts to bother him sooner and with more force than i think it should like i don't know why he why he kind of changes his tune like like keep up the sarcasm you know that's your defense obviously but i i don't know it was just something that i thought about are you talking about like when after the whole meeting with the group, and they're trying to get him to confess, but then they sort of send him away because they want to have a tea break. And as he's walking back, mm-hmm. he's he greets sixty one, and and he's ignored. Is that what you mean? About yeah, and how about how that bothers him? Because yeah, I don't like think he's he, bothered he, by the he, committee he, meeting. He tears he up the confession and everything. The, yeah, he doesn't seem to keep up the stream of sarcasm, like. As if, like, the turning around thing was starting to, you know, get to him. I, I, I don't know. It's like, I, it, it, it's a little bit past this, I think, that it, and I made a note of it. I said, why does this bother him at all? You know, he's, 
there's so many times where he's not bothered by anything else they when a committee or some kind of person says you know you're not going along with x y and z mm-hmm. and it's like okay when when does he ever you know what like why would this start to to bother him at all you know you were talking about number 2 not get, being the focus right off the bat early on it's very interesting because it seems like number 2 and this committee or council whatever it's called there's no connection whatsoever. Right. Yeah, like, and 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 we find out that's purposeful. But I just thought that was very interesting. You know, number or like number two is just like whatever. You know, mm-hmm. I I don't have anything to do with it. I don't have anything to do with it. I have no sway over it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but you say that okay, maybe in in the committee room itself, he might be a bit put off and such. But then when he steps outside and there's the people again and 42 is still crying away, he just yeah. starts giving everybody a round of applause as he walks away. Yeah, yeah. And, and I do like, I. that's funny. And I do like, I do like that. Yeah. It's, I think it's probably just a little bit past this when I, when I really start to think like he seems to be like it's starting to affect him more than right. than I thought it you know should like like almost to the point of unnerving him or or he's starting to take it seriously you know it was like a little too soon okay all right I I also again this is something that they've done before too when you talk about things that are being done you know as he walks back to his house he gets a copy of the tally ho and already news travels fast you know number six is under investigation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? That that is that is kind of creepy and we've seen this before. Like mm-hmm. an event has barely happened and it's suddenly in the news or being announced over the loudspeaker. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And you know what? And then and there there's a moment he he's he gets mad about that and yes. crumples up the newspaper. Again, I would think by this point he he really shouldn't really give much of a damn about these things. But, you know, to him it's like, so what? I'm not here to be sociable. <laughs> right. I mean, right. it makes sense later when threats are made. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. then then you can understand him being, you know, disturbed and such and upset. But I, I see what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. 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 You think almost instead he'd chuckle at the idea that they're – that he's under investigation. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. He gets back to his house where... Did you enjoy the show? There is a saying, the slowest mule is nearest to the whip. Yes, and another, he who digs a pit will one day lie in it. Or is number two above investigation? Nobody is above investigation. Failure to cooperate makes one an outcast. What? No more taxes? No more credit? Believe me, it could be only a beginning. You should know. I hope that you do not think that I am a member of this committee. Well, of course not. Never. I assure you, no matter what significance you may hold for me, to the uh, village and its committee, uh, you are merely citizen number six, who has to be tolerated, and if necessary, shaped to fit. Public enemy number six. If you insist. But public enemies cannot be tolerated indefinitely. Be careful. Do not defy this committee. If the hearings go against you, I am powerless to help you. Ah, my dear. Uh, Number 86 has had valuable experience with the committee. As a member... I suffered the shame of being posted. Disharmonious. How terrible for you. The hearings were fair and just. I was at fault. Oh, but this is irrelevant. With your permission, sir, number six has a busy schedule. First, the social group, then the medical. Of course. But do carry on. Well, you no time for tea. No, only your future. First, your frivolous attitude towards the committee. Most dangerous. Uh. The hearings are televised. That is why your behavior is so important. You stand before the entire community. The social group is your one hope. Fortunately, I too have been attached to the group. The most fortunate, yes. Oh, please, you must try to cooperate. I will. Join in with the group spirit. Naturally. Only they can help you with the committee. Naturally. 
I did like the exchange of phrases, expressions, where where it's like a mule is closest to the whip and he who digs a pit will one day lie in it. Yeah. I like those. I got to tell you, this number two is very interesting. At first, he so reminded me of the actor Stubby K. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you know who that is? I know know Stubby K. Yep. Okay, who is in uh, one of my uh, my most favorite musical of all time, Guys and Dolls. He's in the movie. Uh, he was in the Broadway play, too, as Nicely Nicely Johnson. I almost thought that that was Stubby K at first. He's very much like him, uh, albeit uh, British. But his delivery right off the bat is so odd. It's so quiet, almost monotone. That he does sort of mark himself as a as a as yet a different kind of number two right off the bat, and so I you know I walked away from this episode liking this number two. I liked him too myself, and again I like the whole thing of, you know, he still tries to warn the prisoner. You gotta, you know, because I have no control over this committee. You you've got to take it more seriously. Even going so far as assigning eighty six to him, right? You know, right to help yeah. bring him around because she was at one time an unmutual. Yeah, ah, uh, number eighty six. <laughs> um, she's she she's sort of severe looking when we first meet her, mm-hmm. but you know. And we'll, we can talk more about it as she as she loosens up a little bit, but um, very interesting character. This is a fairly male dominated show. Yes, and and for the time and for England, it's not much of a surprise. But if you really stand back, there are some very interesting female characters in this show, and we've talked a, a lot about them and i'm i'm ranking her as you know one of the very interesting uh characters um i don't know there's something about the actress that i can't really put my finger on but 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 i you know i liked it when she was on screen very very interesting and i and as we get into it a little further i've got some more thoughts about her Mm -hmm. but here's the thing though despite all that here he's maintaining his flippancy, the prisoner, with her. Yeah, definitely. Well, but but that's usually his attitude towards women, right? <laughs> you know, it, uh, in this show. Yeah, this, so that, that didn't really you know surprise me. And she comes off as you know pretty kind of nasty, you know, mm-hmm. in 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 the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I thought it interesting because she wants him to sit in on group rehabilitation. And I thought, okay, this is going to be great because he's going to be really sarcastic and they're going to throw out these wild, crazy 60s ideas and stuff. And it's this really short scene. It really doesn't run very long. And yet they've got, what, like four or five people in the group. So they got these actors and each of them have their lines and stuff. I was a little disappointed that that got cut short. Yeah, I like it because it's outdoors. Yes. And and I wrote a note to myself. There's both actual outdoor shots at, at Port Miron, but there's quite a lot of outdoor shots that are actually indoor on, <laughs> on sets, but with really big backdrops that, for some reason, that's never struck me before. We've seen a lot of... You know, indoor, outdoor, outdoor, indoor sets before, right. but for some reason, uh, you know, I I was really struck by that that it, that the the backdrops were huge, and I was reading somewhere about it that it, it called them painted backdrops, but they looked more like they blew up photographs of Port Miran really, really big. If they're if they're actually painted, then I thought they were pretty good, but I I don't mind those shots because i think they lend a sort of weird you know unreality to to the village but i was kind of chuckling to myself because there's it's quite a lot it's used quite a lot in this episode Mm, yeah i i also did like at least the bit where 
the prisoner tries to get in the whole point that even poetry has a certain harmony to it, which sort of throws everybody off. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's a fun, that's a fun moment, right? <laughs> it does. Uh, but then, and I guess this co- sort of goes against, I don't know if, if, if you call it sarcasm or what, because they're like, all right, this guy is hopeless. So they take him into the hospital to be, you know, examined and stuff. And he gets into the cab, Willingly, yeah. I, I think there's an almost resistance, and then and then he just is like, "Oh, okay, let's go." Yeah, you know, uh, kind of a thing. Where's the scene in here where he looks through the little round window into the room with the guy being that's, converted? That's at the hospital. It's shortly because he's he's examined by the doctor where he's yeah. given a clean bill of health and I got to quickly say love the doctor's office with the the glass almost walls around it and then the lighting and the way it reflects off the the glass and yeah. stuff I thought that was really cool yeah. and I got to throw in really quick the doctor played by George Parvda who appeared in 3 Doctor Who stories <laughs> So. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> he was he was in he was Dennis in two episodes of Enemy of the World. That story I told you about, where the Doctor meets his uh, twin, so to speak, who yeah. basically rules a good part of the Earth. <laughs> Listen, with with over fifty years of Doctor Who, <laughs> pretty much every British actor ever has been in that show true it's almost it's almost like you don't even need to call it out <laughs> they're all been in they've all been i'm surprised mcgoon was never in doctor who <laughs> I, you know that has been a surprise to me he and patrick stewart yeah, right, right. <laughs> wait has patrick mcnee ever been in doctor who uh no but oh. honor blackman has okay and so has <laughs> diana rigg oh, okay yeah. wow yeah. wow Okay, listen, he looks through that little window, right? Right. And he sees that guy being converted or whatever, Mm -hmm. right? In one of my books, it claims that that set is the one that we've seen before when he looks through the little, I think it's in Arrival. That's not right. Uh, That set of that room looked different. The, um, The guy is sitting on the floor, for one thing. In Arrival. In Arrival. Right. In fact, no, there's a bunch of people. They're all lined up. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the same set. I think that's wrong. And somebody out there can correct me if I'm wrong. But did did you – that almost seemed like a new set to me. It was that really unusual rounded, like half-rounded ceiling Mm -hmm. thing behind him. I I, I think this was all new. I mean, like I said, even the doctor's examination room with yeah. the, with the rounded glass wall uh, yeah. for half of it. That all is, I, I don't, you know, because it stands out, it's striking. I would I remember agree. something like that. Yeah, and as much as they reuse mm-hmm. sets in this show, I felt there was new stuff that we were seeing. The committee chamber is a reuse. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Just, that's just the dome room, right? Right. I think exactly. It was in some kind of like rules that you that had to be used in every single episode. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Everything needs to be, you know, every room in every scene needs to be the dome room redressed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, when he turns away from looking in that room, he also talks to number 46, a man who claims he has been saved. But if you look at him up close, you see the markings mm-hmm. on his forehead and it looks like he's been lobotomized. Right. He's got that scar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh Now, I know you've asked me about this before and I don't talk a lot about it, but I guess... I never really came to appreciate it as much as I am starting to now. But it's at this point, one of my favorite music cues starts up here. As the committee once again meets with the prisoner and threatens him with the same treatment as 46 got, and that music starts to play as he walks away. It's the same music I use for, well, I don't use it. I I take these uh, intros and outros for the podcast from uh, a a PBS station 
uh, in the 80s where the host introduced and offered some information. I thought these were interesting. Let me play a few of these. But the music cue is used there as well. And I, I love it. It's just so subtle with the piano playing and all. Good. I'm I'm so glad you finally been <laughs> led to the water and drink from it. <laughs> oh no no! I you know, and every episode is we're saying goodbye. Uh, uh-huh. It's the music from "It's a Dreamy Party." <laughs> <laughs> this is a dreamy party. party yes. <laughs> oh, I love that scene. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, though, as he leaves, it suddenly clicks to me. There's two saying he has no sway with the committee. But suddenly I look at the wall and I noticed I didn't notice it before. I went back and I found a few others. There's pictures of him everywhere with the slogan, the community needs you. Yeah. Yes. If he's yeah. got no sway with the committee, why are they putting up pictures of him all over the place? Well, this is when you start to realize that number two is not as distanced <laughs> from this whole thing as he lead, he's trying to lead you to believe. Yep. Yep. And now that, you know, he's becoming more and more incorrigible, now more of the village is starting to cut him off. The newsman doesn't give him a copy of the paper, you know, but he does manage to get a hold of one and he sees the announcement that he has been declared unmutual. Even his phone is cut off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his cell phone's been, his service has been d- d- disconnected, right? Yep. Yeah, the, I, and we're into the point where, like, I'm going to say it again, like, he's. Like, I, I'm surprised that he starts to take it as serious. You know, he's not he's not giving his witty, you know, one liners and things a- anymore. He, I would almost think, you know, he's number six already feels like he's an army of one, you know, against the world. I, I'm not sure why this is bothering him so much. I th- what it is is that the the village, you know, number two, the committee, who all of them, they're all of the opinion that even the loner is going to get too lonely. Hmm. And because they're assuming that he's like everybody else, that isol- being isolated, being ostracized is going to rack up you know, some heavy duty, um, you know, ill mental health points against him, you know, and I'm kind of surprised that, that it does seem to affect him as as quickly and as much as, as it does when, when you'd almost think that he's already thinks of himself as alone. What, what difference would it make? You right. know, but it's, it's the story and, and, you know, I, I get it. And, and, uh, and go along uh, go along with it. And then he's greeted back at his house by a subcommittee that includes <laughs> our crying number 42. We represent the Appeals Subcommittee. Quick off the mark. Number 42. Appeals Subcommittee already. You certainly get around. Do not sneer at number 42. To volunteer for social work of this nature requires considerable moral courage. Risk of infection from the untouchables. Bitterness will not help you, number six. You have brought your misfortunes on yourself. Nevertheless, you ladies, I'm sure, out of the goodness of your hearts, will help me. It is clearly premature to look for contrition in the poor creature. Again, I had to think how much of that was his frustration and how much of that was his misogyny because the subcommittee is made up of all women. I think this is the first time... We've rolled uh, uh, you, <laughs> we, you have. We've rolled out that word. That's a whole boy. That's a can of worms there. <laughs> no, I Jack. thought we've used that word before. No. Wow, have we? Okay, there's a. That's an immense discussion. Right. Is number six a misogynist? Very interesting, because I've always looked at it as he got to a point in his career when he realized that there wasn't any place for women or that the, or that could be a weakness to someone in his line of work right you know he he saw he saw too many james bond movies and realized <laughs> you know and and that that he just put up a wall um but but you know 
by saying that, you're suggesting that he really dislikes women just in general. Very interesting. Wow, is that a huge discussion? <laughs> well, it's, it's something I've seen in yeah. quite a number of like prisoner groups and stuff like that. That okay. you know, okay. d- does he hate women? I, I mean, even the fact that he could use a woman to his own ends and and means yeah. is a certain sort of hatred that you can't regard them as you know, yeah, equal or on par or whatever. Yeah, you know. It, I can, I can almost go with it, or as far as in this show, he is he has females used against him right. over and over and over again, like in this episode. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you. Well, we'll get to it, but uh, there's a there is an actual misogynist in this episode. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, very much so. So, and and it's interesting because you talk about. You know, him being alone and all that, the loner being totally alone and all. And I thought maybe this was a little too on the nose because there's a quick scene of number two observing the prisoner and saying, you know, he will not, I hope he will not stand being alone for long. Right. And this is what I'm getting at is, is that's what, that's what they're placing their hopes on or this new scheme Mm -hmm. is that. They he number two and and I, I you know I guess number eighty six, they believe that even the you know strongest loner cannot take total isolation for mm-hmm. very long before cracking you know right yeah you know he's and and he is he's totally ignored people are walking away from him the cafe mm-hmm. waiter won't serve him. Mm-hmm. Now, did you notice, though, that when he meets with the subcommittee again and he steps up to them, he's got this totally disheveled look? Yeah, I I did notice that. It's his, it's the hair, right. you know, mostly. Right. right. And I think that's, you know, that was meant to convey to us, the audience, that it's starting to break him down. There's a funny thing with that. Later in this episode, <laughs> they use a shot from when he's outdoors and he's getting away from the the group that's meeting outdoors they <laughs> they insert a shot from that but later on where he's outdoors and his hair is back to being nice and neat and parted and <laughs> swept to the side and then all of a sudden there's this insert shot of him sticking his head through you know, the foliage and he's all disheveled again. And I laughed to myself like they, you know, they needed a, a an insert shot there, kind of a close up of him. And I think they just grabbed it from earlier in the episode and stuck it in there because then the very next scene his hair is right back to being neat and tidy again. <laughs> now he gets back to his place and two calls to warn him that the conversion is going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. There's even an announcement. Your attention, please. Here is an announcement for all staff psychologists and psychiatrists. Those wishing to study the conversion of number six on the hospital's closed circuit television, please report immediately to the hospital common room. Thank you for your attention. As then suddenly this swarm of of villagers, including the subcommittee, attack him and drag him to the hospital. That's an incredible scene. Yeah. Splendid number six. Just in time for the procession. And, and kind of scary. Yes. <laughs> they all just dogpile yep. on him and and start hitting him and, and, and then drag him off. Yep. It's a really incredible scene. It is. It is. And, and very scary. Terrifying, even, you know. Well, when you consider, I mean, we don't know time-wise the the because you know sometimes time's a little fluid on these TV shows in general. Uh, yeah. How much time he's technically been alone that he could get to the state, and then what happens the first time he sees a crowd of people coming towards him? They're beating the hell out of him. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, but he's brought to the hospital. He's strapped to a table, 
And number 86 is there as she explains by television to the psychiatrist and the committee members who are watching in another room that ultrasound is going to be used to lobotomize him. I'm holding my hand up. Okay. <laughs> Two things. Yes. This is where I this is around the point where I think that I read a thing that's that that McGowan wanted a, a very complex shot. And it is, and it is, and I remember thinking this at the time. It's really interesting. The camera is panning over what he's laying on, what he's strapped to, the table seat thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, like, this is a very elaborate shot and very interesting. And then the other thing is, is that this scene is where my estimation of the character of 86 starts to go up. And I start to find her very fascinating. So she's got her hair down now. Yes. Oh, oh, well, we find out that she is like a doctor or something or whatever. Her (laughs) – I'm laughing thinking about it. Her delivery is really funny. And I wonder why – the way she's explaining everything as if everybody watching is a complete idiot. (laughs) We are using standard equipment. Unit containing quartz crystal is activated by a variable electromagnetic field from these high voltage condensers here. The crystal emits ultrasonic sound waves which are bounced off the parabolic reflector here. The focal point of the reflector can be seen here by use of light waves. I will now demonstrate the molecular turbulence at the focal point. Right? Like, it's so technical. And do you, do you get what I'm saying? The way she's very slowly and pointing to each thing as she goes along is just really, really funny. And it made me wonder, like, what went into writing and performing you know, that scene. Like, why is she acting like everybody's an idiot around her? Like, she's explaining it to children. Sonic beam is capable of penetrating, whereas the light is not. Now, the prime concern is to locate the link point of the frontal lobes. To do this, we turn to a low voltage rating and, so to speak, feel our focal point in excess. Ah, we have now located the medial aspect of the left motor area. Three centimeters in, 1.5 centimeters up, 0.45 centimeters right, 0.023 centimeters down, 0.0015 up. Precise. The ultrasonic beam is now focused on the exact link point of the frontal lobes. Lanolin barrier to minimize external cell breakdown and subsequent scar tissue. Relaxant to preclude muscular reaction. Now to step up the voltage until the ultrasonic bombardment causes permanent dislocation. But it's interesting, though, because, and this is where I was a little confused at first, because just as the power is building up and everything, she just very quietly, you know, when no one's looking, turns the power down, the the force of the wave. Yeah. You know, as we come to the end of the scene. Yeah. Now, here again, we've seen this all before. The prisoner subdued, the prisoner taken to the hospital, whatever. 
and some procedure done to him and it screws up his brain, you mm-hmm. know. So in that sense, there's another thing where that's where I would say, like, no new ground is being broken. He's he's had this how many times? The only thing you do is you sit and wonder, how is he going to get out of this one? Or is it one of the ones where they really do do this thing to him and mm-hmm. he, through force of will he's got to drag himself back? Or is it one of those ones where he's just acting like it worked, you know, and he's going to surprise them all at once? Right. Um um, but but you know again we we've seen this before and I and I and I said it to myself like why do they bother with these things when the when it's never worked before on him but it seems pretty severe you know like wow he's being lobotomized ouch well when he first comes around too he's mm-hmm. you know he's acting like a simpleton he's got this goofy smile on his face he yeah. you know he he walks by that aversion chamber again looks in and you know no emotional reaction this time like the last time yeah yeah you yeah. know he so, he's, he's welcoming of the village people when they throw him a parade and everything mm-hmm. it, it, it seems like it worked out, at, right as they're walking out and it took me a, a little bit to, to, for this to hit my brain. 86 is going along with him, right? Mm-hmm. And it took me a while. And I th- finally it hit my brain. I thought, mm-hmm. no female in this show has ever dressed like she is in this. So she doesn't have her lab coat on. She's got a blue dress, a dress, and she's in heels or whatever. And she's going along, you know, helping him along and going all the way back to his home with him and and it's i don't it's like i don't know why it's like wow it's like no no woman in this show has ever been what uh, what i would call dressed up and and i thought wow what an odd choice i wonder why they did that and then the funny thing is is you find we find out a little bit down the road that it's on purpose and it's actually brought up but i just (laughs) don't know why it was just a funny thought that that hit me during this Right, you're going to have to tell me when we get to that point because I that part I don't remember. Yeah, you know the explanation of the dress and all. I mean, I get the whole thing of her bringing him back because, as we find out, he got enough of a zap, I guess, to sort of stun him. So that's why he's initially docile, and yeah. then basically yeah. she tries to keep him drugged so right. that he thinks that. He's lobotomized, I right. guess. So, well, spoiler alert. Yeah. We find out that they didn't really do that to him. Right. But they did They did what they thought was enough to make, you know, what a, a risk. Like, you know, it's almost far-fetched. Like, we're going to make him think he was lobotomized. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and 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 it's you know it's not really, and it's like you, you know when you when you learn that it's like wow that's gonna wear off really quick. I think it's when it, it is. It's when he watches her make the the tea, right? That and I thought because you're still at the point where you think oh they really did do this thing to him, but but when, as he's doing that because it was telegraphed. Earlier in the episode, he's making tea himself. You you start to think, oh, that simple act, but done by somebody else, is going to be enough of a, a lifeline for him to grab onto and drag himself, you know, back to to normalcy. And then, of course, you know, he gets wise to it and and pours the pours the tea out because he. I love that where he ma- he says, what does he say? Not blank. Does he say blanket? No, he says I need a rug. I'm chilly. It, yeah, well, yeah. Well, 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 no. What I love about it is it's just it's you know, it's just with it's monosyllabic. Yes, rug. monosyllabic, and and he barks. Chilly. <laughs> yeah. Bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> but it's enough for him to to pour the 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 tea away, so he's not further drugged or affected, yeah. and he, and he's starting to get his wits back. And the and the thing is, it's so weird because eighty six leaves and two suddenly appears, and now we find out what this whole thing was about. Time for our talk, number six. Our talk. Ah, yes. 
Now that all your aggressive anxieties have been expunged, let us say forever, I know that you will feel free to speak. Free. Particularly free about that little incident which has been causing you such absurd distress. Yeah. The speak. trivia, the trivia of your resignation. Yes, you resign. Why? Why prematurely? Why did you resign? It's difficult. Try time to and... Think. Oh, time. That was it, was it? No, it wasn't you time. You couldn't stand your jobs. No! No time to think. No! I'm asking you, not telling you! Please don't be angry. I'm not angry, my dear friend. Yes. That is just the way things seem to be to you. Yes. Because your new world is so quiet by contrast. Is yes. it? For you, agitation is a thing of the past. Yes. Lay back and rest, lay back and yes. rest. We can yes. have our little chat later on. <laughs> when you've had time collect your thoughts with us watching it the way we've watched this or whatever it's almost as if that had been that whole thing was just forgotten like they gave up on that right it's re- almost like oh wow like this is back again the the original thing you know the original thing that they've tried to do to it. you know episodes are usually why did you resign or to uh, subjugate him into just being a villager, you know? Mm-hmm. Or, or pardon me, or they're, I'm trying to escape episodes. Right. You know, and and to has suddenly have, why did you resign? It was like, it was almost like a new thing. Like, oh, yeah, that's right. That is what they were trying to get out of him originally. <laughs> yep. So, so that was that was really interesting. You know, um, number six takes a chance by when he pours out the t- the drugged tea, because if he wasn't really in his right mind, he knows damn well he's almost always being watched. Mm-hmm. He's it's lucky that number two didn't see him pour that out. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. because later on, he's going to see something else. Right. 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 You know. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, but I just I just want to say though, I that is I think where I put my finger on why I like this episode because I didn't see like you said, oh, we're back to this. I wasn't seeing where this one was going and then suddenly, why did you resign? Okay, that makes sense. And to and of course we could never really lobotomize him. Remember, we got to be careful with the tissue. Yeah, I, it's like I was saying to myself, wait, where's that line? Yeah. It's how many episodes? It's like, come on, I want to hear them say tissues. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but but the idea is pretty much there. It's just that they don't actually <laughs> say that. But, yeah, they're always so concerned about, you know, uh, harming the tissues. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, you know. He's left alone because he gets agitated, so two gives him some time to calm down so he can collect yeah. his thoughts. And yeah. he goes over and he sees the scar, you know. And that's the thing. It's nicely played out because he doesn't have anybody to bounce off of here. But from the looks of it, he's even questioning, did something happen? I feel weird. Something's wrong. Look, yes. there's a scar and all that. He's yes. pacing the apartment as two and 86 are watching from two's place. Two is like, you got to give him another dose now. And she's like, he's already still got one in his system. She doesn't realize, you know, he dumped it and stuff. Right. And he's right. like, go back and do it. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's that you're right. That is a whole interesting sequence, but it really helps to, sh- you know, shore things up for um, number six to to stamp out of it further. But uh, but I love it because she's got to tramp all the way back to his place yep. and start the whole thing with the tea mm-hmm. all over again. And then I love it when he basically says, well, you get out of the way. I'm going to show you how to make tea. Yep. You know. And it's an opportunity she manages to put the drug into his cup, but then he manages to switch the cups when she's not looking, but two is this time. Yeah. 
Yeah. The the old switcheroo. Yep. Okay, are we are we pretty much at the point with the where the rampant misogyny comes out? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, because he's furious at her, right? Yeah, yeah, and and what he? he says that stupid woman. Yep. Not that stupid person or how stupid or whatever. Right. But there's real force and real, I think, misogyny behind that. That stupid woman. Oh yeah. You know. Okay. Number 86 is now under the influence of that drug, right? Yes. It's made her docile. There comes the moment about how how her apparel. Uh, she says she says to number 6, "Do you like my dress?" And you re- I think then at that moment you realize that part of what is going on is that she was supposed to seduce him. <sighs> I see. And of course, you know, being drugged, it's like, you yeah. know, in wine yeah. truth, she's she's sort of now relaxing more. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there's there was already a little flirtation going on, but but not a whole lot. But now it's really starting to come out more. And she's kind of doing it sort of weekly or willy nilly or whatever because she's, you know, under the influence of the drug. But I thought that was so funny because I was already thinking about the way she was dressed. And then all of a sudden she says to him, do you like my dress? Mm -hmm. And I love it because he completely ignores that. He doesn't comment (laughs) on it at all and just goes on with, you know, whatever he's saying. There's another really, really interesting line from number two. And it's, it's, it's coming up and I can't remember exactly where it is, but he makes a reference to, her taking care of him, quote, physically, and I actually made a note of that. He actually uses that term, too. And I thought that was kind of strong mm-hmm. for this show because, again, it, 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 sh- it shows that part of the plan was that she was to, you know, seduce him uh, and rope him in not only mentally but physically. That might be the point where, and we're actually up to it, because, you know, he sees her now all docile. He sees she got the drug. So he calls her in his fit of anger to report to him immediately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I read another thing about this episode, a behind-the-scenes thing, that supposedly in the original script, the flirtation... The, the or seduction thing was supposed to be a lot stronger, and McGowan axed it. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember if they gave an actual reason why, but right. a, I thought that was also uh, fascinating. Um, and I think we've talked about this before. Mm-hmm. Somebody once told me that McGowan was, and this could just be a rumor hearsay and maybe it's not even true i don't know that magoon was so devoted to his wife that he wouldn't even do on screen romantic scenes with actresses i could believe that that he believed in the sanctity of his own personal life and marriage that 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 it would it would be wrong to even you know play act as and, and I always think about that with him because I'm thinking back, even with and I haven't seen a lot of Danger Man slash Secret Agent, but I what I have seen there's really not any, you know, it's like in a lot of ways the character of John Drake and the character of Number Six is is like McGowan that he, you know, wouldn't have anything to do with other women other than well his wife, you know. I don't know. It's just something that that occurred to me throughout this whole thing. Hmm. I, I I could see that though. I could absolutely see that. Yeah. 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 So and she's called. She heads out. The prisoner goes off and takes a walk. He briefly meets up with our lobotomized forty six. Yeah. Um, and they have a little interchange there. But, yeah. And but then we get to the scene that. 
I, I don't know, because we're talking about how he's realizing things and he's coming out of it and everything. He goes back to the workout area, and from the looks of it, he's hesitant to try anything. Until mm-hmm. right. our two guys show up again to <laughs> to bully him again. Yeah. And it's the weirdest thing because they start to give him you know, a, a few hits and stuff. And it seems like that's the final straw. He kind of comes back as the fighter and, and, and he takes them both out. I think it is. I think you're absolutely correct. It's like um, muscle memory. Mm. When they start hitting him, his adrenaline starts flowing. Right. And that might be enough. Uh, uh, and then he remembers that at that moment that he's not uh, a victim He's a fighter. Mm. So in some ways, those guys put the nail in the coffin to the whole scheme, whether they you know realize it or not. And and I love it. He starts to fight back, and then he whips their asses again. <laughs> you know, and muchly deserved, you know. I wanted to call out one other thing that I kept thinking about when he's still kind of docile and going through it. McGowan uses that band-aid on his temple his forehead right. as, as as a sort of prop mm-hmm. that every time he's sort of makes a reference to a change of mind he fingers that band-aid and it's just one of those wonderful little touches that an actor can do to to emphasize things without actually saying the words you know like he's referring to the operation without saying the words but he touches the band-aid and you get the point it's just one of those you know one of those interesting little things that that an actor can do i i didn't really make the connection but you're right i like that yeah I, yeah. you know what i think i'm probably more into this episode than i realized <laughs> Uh, they, I, like I said, there's a lot to speak well of it. And as you said at the beginning, you know, you want to point to a typical episode, something that defines, you know, may not always be the best, but it really does have all the earmarks of a good yeah. prisoner episode. Yeah. yeah. You know? Now, you know, he then, after thumping those two guys again he goes off and he meets up with 86 who still hasn't gotten to number two she's wandering around picking <laughs> plants that she wants to bring to him to make him happy <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god and i thought this was interesting you know there's another call report to number two before she goes though see watch yes watch see the little green light. When I look at that, I always feel sleepy. Makes me want to sleep. Sleep. I am your superior. Here are my instructions. Listen carefully. Here is what I want you to do. I am going to count from four down to one. And then you are going to make a full report on the social conversion of number six, four, three, two, one. Everything went as planned, sir. We created the illusion of a full ultrasonic dislocation of the frontal lobes of the brain. How was this done? By using just sound. No ray, no focal point. The patient lost consciousness? The result of an intradermal injection of mitral I gave him. I see. How was the illusion maintained? The patient is being kept heavily tranquilized. Well done, 86. Thank you, sir. Was there anything further? Yes. Here are your final instructions. Listen carefully. This is what I want you to do. When the village clock strikes four. I love it because, you know, he's setting something up and we're not, we don't get the final thing 
you know, we get the, and here's what I want you to do, dot, 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 and then cut away. Right. Here's so, what I want you to do at the, at the stroke of four. Yeah. Oh, yeah. here's a funny little thing to watch for in, in fiction, in TV shows and movies and, and even in books. If, a, if characters start to talk about a plan and it cuts away before you hear what the details of the plan are, it's almost always going to work. Mm-hmm. If we, the audience, hear the details of the plan, it's usually not going to work. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's just one of those cliches or tropes, you know, in, in fiction. And so I knew whatever he was going to do was going to work because we didn't get to, we the audience didn't get to hear it. Right. So we get to be surprised with everybody else. But if he had said, OK, at the stroke of four, you know, when the when the bells chime or the clock chimes or whatever, you're going to, you know, get on uh, the loudspeaker and say this and this. It wouldn't have worked because then there's it was just all telegraphed. you know. Yeah. But it's it's a nice touch too the way he plays it all out because Mm -hmm. he goes to two's house, says he wants to continue to talk. He's playing up the whole docile behavior. You know, the procedure worked, you know, that even though he didn't get that second drug, he seems to be very willing to talk. He wants to confess to the community. He also wants to thank everyone who had a hand in his uh, conversion. Um, So, the village all gathers in the square and we've seen scenes like this before um, yes. with uh, what was it the election episode yeah you know, I was going to say that yeah. so I'm glad you did yeah right you know we've seen this we've seen this before sure you, know, <laughs> you, you, you don't trust the man with the megaphone after the last time right. but here we go you're cheating me you're cheating me that is a mistake it is number two you should applaud Until he brought about my social conversion, and believe me, it was him and not your committee, until then, I was a rebel, an unmutual, senselessly resisting this, our fine community. (laughs) To borrow one of number two's sayings, the butcher with the sharpest knife has the warmest heart. So he gets up there and he talks about his own ills and what have you, and he urges the villagers. Some of you have resisted in the past, have withheld knowledge, which was important to number two. Now, thanks to social conversion, I want to tell you all something, and I trust that my example will inspire you all to tell, to tell, As the clock strikes four, and it's just perfect timing, 86 walks right up and points at number two and declares, Number two is unmutual. Unmutual. Social conversion for number two. The unmutual. Number 86 has a confession that number two is unmutual. Unmutual. Look at it. An unmutual who desires to deceive you all. Unmutual. Welfare committee is the tool of those who wish to possess your minds. You still have a choice. Number two you can is still unmutual. salvage your right to be unmutual. individuals, Number your rights to truth and free thought. Reject this false world of number two. Reject it now. It's it is a it's a good moment. Yeah, it, it's fun. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it's like yeah, he, okay, you know, number six did it again. He stuck it to the man. Yeah, <laughs> but it it also goes to show you how your you know your propaganda, your mind screwing, you know, whatever whatever you want to call it, you know, can only go so far. It can he also just work against you because. You know, after all that with this whole concept of pointing out people who are unmutual or or disassociative, there the village now turns on him and on on, on number two and chase after him as the prisoner watches. And oddly enough, 
there's our butler, there's Angelo, walking away with the umbrella up. That's a really odd scene. Yes. That really made me say, what exactly was is that was that intended to mean? He, he, the umbrella is open. Yes. And I, I said to myself, I guess we're being told, like, when it rains, it pours. Mm-hmm. Or you know, I'm not going to get caught in the in the rain. But that that little character, it, it's almost like more is said with him, without words, than with the characters that do get to speak. You know, and especially in this one, I was really taken with how much uh, Angelo again is used in this episode. Uh, going back to uh, the, the about pulling the table section out. Yes, in, in the committee <laughs> in the room. committee room to let the prisoner out. Is such a good bit of business because because you know Magoonak's so pissed <laughs> for that whole thing, you know, and Angelo just you know okay, buddy, here we go. I'm letting you out now. <laughs> the way they stare and look at each other, you know, is good. Hey, I forgot, I forgot this completely. We never talked about this. Mm-hmm. The bald headed controller. He's back. Is in an early scene, right? Yes. Yep. He passes number six. At one point, right? Right. That's the first time they've ever been in a scene together. Oh. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I, I, it's just one of those dumb little things that I that you know that that I'm thinking about. You know, and uh, at the end also, I I really like uh, that number two the way he's acting throughout the whole thing with when number six is. It looks like he's going to do it. He's going to, you know, tell him why he resigned. And then when number six starts adding more layers into that, <laughs> that like you can tell number two is like, um, what? Uh, OK, but like I'm going to go along with this. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, well, I want to say it to everybody. Uh, OK. Uh, and then it like and, and then maybe they'll can, you know, uh, confess all their secrets. Oh well, that's a good idea, number six. You know, but as it starts unraveling, you know that he he realizes that oh shit, this isn't really going the way I wanted it. (laughs) Well, the thing is, it's funny because I'm thinking, you know, he's been there long enough now that no matter how confident you feel in your process. I still would never trust the man to get it in a microphone or a megaphone in front of a crowd again, ever. Right. Um, you know, it's one of those fool me once things. It reminds me of years ago, the, you know, the graduating class didn't have a, a prank. The, you know, cause usually a lot of these schools do pranks with their, their graduating class, but it turns out they did. This one kid who was quiet all four years he was in the school, he walks by the front office that morning, and the dean is getting ready to go make announcements, and he says, can I do the announcements? I've never done anything in the school. I've been in no clubs or activity, anything. <laughs> and the dean doesn't know him from Adam. So she goes, okay. <laughs> and he proceeds to go and take the book with the announcements. He goes through the entire announcements, no problem, does those well. But he signs off by saying, I want to thank everybody for the great education I received. And I am proud to say that I will be a graduating member of the class of 2012 or something like that at Dee's Nuts University. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, no, but see, see, this is where it gets more interesting. So, of course, they cut him off quickly, pull him out of the uh, the the broadcast room, you know, the, 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 the little room where they do that. And, yeah. you know, there's this whole thing. A couple of minutes go by. The kids are all cracking up in the homerooms and stuff. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, there's the, 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 the loudspeaker goes back on again, and the kid comes back on. And I'm huh. like, what's going on? Why is the kid? Oh my God, they're going to make him apologize. All right, I guess, you know. So the kid goes, I must apologize because I said something wrong just a few moments ago. I claimed I was going to Dee's Nuts University. There is no such place as Dee's Nuts University. <laughs> Again, yank. He's pulled it. And it's like, you got fooled once. That's the situation here with our prisoner. You let him get up there with the bullhorn. Don't do it again. I don't care how docile he may seem. Right. 
Well, there's there's not there's not very much intelligence by the, the people who run the village. You know? Right. You know, you, well, I almost the, no, it's not about intelligence. Like, it's about trust in the system. And the thing is, when you use the system to a certain end, you have that much faith in the system, then, you know, you can't see the shades of gray. Yeah. And that's the problem with the prisoner. There isn't shades of gray. You're either with us, you're against us, you know, you're, you're, there's, there's, and, and I don't understand it because after all this time even, and because we've talked about this, that maybe they're trying to groom him to be a number two or something. Why? The, he's not cracking. You don't want to damage him. So okay. you're going to have to accept him as he is. Right, right. You know? You wonder why number one just doesn't get fed up and just go to the village himself to take care of the <laughs> Right. You know, or or after a while they just shoot number six and <laughs> <laughs> dump them in the in the ocean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just I don't know. You know, I mean, and I say this. I mean, I mean, I love the show. I'm not trying to you know because some I, I get this sometimes with some of the other things I do. It's like if I if I poke holes and they go, you know, you're nitpicking. It's like no, I'm looking at this as someone being critical. I love it. I still yeah. love the show. I would watch it again and again. Yeah. But if you're going to sit there and you're just going to say everything is glorious and wonderful, there's a problem. And the fact oh, is, there is there is there is something inherently wrong with the premise of the prisoner, in the sense that after a while, who could be that naive to think that you're going to get this guy on your side right. without damaging the tissue? Yeah. Two thoughts mm -hmm. um, here at the end. Um, McGowan himself said that even though the show was very short, it was probably too long. Yes, I've heard that. <laughs> right. There's only, what did he say, set, seven. like seven episodes that mm -hmm. really matter or, you know, are important. And you know what? Maybe this sort of, this one kind of shores that up. You know, when the when the when these bigger ideas are being repeated... You know, it's like it, it was a finite show. It had one or two things to say in a broad sense. And and then after that, it's just sort of repeating itself or it's just getting nonsensical. And then the other thing is, is that I don't know why it really hit me during this one is is that you can't you can't really believe that what is what you're watching and what is happening is is supposed to be real mm -hmm. you should really sort of look at everything in the show as allegorical you know um or symbolic it's it, it it's not like supposed to be taken it's not literal and i don't know what it was about this one that really hit that home for for me and I thought, well, you know, that's maybe the way I should have been watching this all along is not even even to or just to take every episode as a thing unto itself and not as a as a, you know, like I'm not supposed to believe that we're constantly, you know, time and time again, a new number two comes in, you know, or. Or, or that they keep trying the same damn thing over and over and over again uh, with him, which is and expecting it to work, which is supposedly the definition of insanity. Yes, uh, that you you know you you really probably should watch this show each episode as its own little world and not worry about its relation to other episodes. You know, which you and I have done quite a bit of, you know, so I don't know. So that's just a, I'll leave you with that thought as we head into the future. And one more fun thing. I just looked this up. So Angela Brown. Right. Her husband was Francis Matthews. And the, he he has a connection to something that we talked about just a little bit earlier. Uh, we talked about UFO right. that was made by uh, Jerry and Sylvia Anderson's uh, 21st. I think it's what is it called? Twenty first century production. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, uh, they made a puppet show called Captain Scarlet. Oh yes, Stirons. Yes, Francis Matthews is the voice was the voice of Captain Scarlet, mm -hmm. and he was the husband of our number eighty six. Yeah, there Captain you go, Scarlet. I, I, I that I remember. 
Mm-hmm. Every, and then particularly the theme song, Captain Scarlet. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it was about as original as Batman, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So put me down as I like this episode. And 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 I'm the same. This is yeah. this is a. It's still solid. I, I get what you're saying yeah. about, you know, we're revisiting old tropes, and and by this time now, really should some of these. But I don't know. Again, also after some of the other episodes where we kind of shied away from them, it was kind of nice to see them again. Oh, oh, sure, sure. And and also, and our our listeners probably don't really know this, but we had a, a very large gap. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. So it, you know what? It could have been that I was sort of starved <laughs> by not watching the show, you know, and it seemed it seemed even better to me. It's another fe- uh, female lead in in an episode where I want to know what happened to her character after. You know, it's like I want to know what happens to number eighty six after this, right? Yeah. You know, um, I don't think she was evil necessarily, but she was, you know, she was going along with the whole thing. She wasn't really a reluctant part uh, uh, where we've had reluctant people who, you know, uh, number two or one of the leaders in the village was forcing them to do something, you know, against number six. She was going along with it. Right. She believed in the science. She believed in what she was doing. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like I'd, I'd be interested to know, you know, do they just get rid? Do they kill her, <laughs> or do they? <laughs> does she get transferred, you know, somewhere else? Yeah. Well, that'll do it for this episode of Once Upon a Village. When we get back together again. We're going to be visiting England again, uh, number six, Will, but he's going to have a different face as he does mm. so. In, wow. Yeah, the episode, Do Not <laughs> Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, which I always get confused just because of the title with Living in Harmony. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. And it, it, w- up to very recently, I was thinking, oh, good, the Western episode is coming up. <laughs> nope, that ain't what that is. Yeah, what a foolie. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting because this was uh, the time that McGowan needed to be away so he could shoot scenes for Ice Station Zebra. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you yeah. ever see that movie? I did, and not, and not too. I, I I'd seen it quite a long time ago, and but I watched it more recently, mm-hmm. and and it was almost like watching it for the first time because I had forgotten a lot of it. Um, McGowan is good in it, but yes. he he you know he could be John Drake. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people have you know conjectured that it is John Drake, but with a different name. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's not it's not any new ground. You know, you know, it wasn't any new ground for him. But it's a good movie, and I do I do like it. Okay, very good. Cool. Look, it looks good. It's it's in it's in the movie that looks good too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. It, it, well, I, I'm a sucker for submarine movies. So. Oh well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So I've seen it several times. <laughs> and, you know, and then Magoo being in it is like bonus. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah. So, folks, stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for, uh, you know, other things coming down the line here with the Chronic Rift Network, including our continuing series uh, presenting the transcription feature in which Kevin Lauderdale takes a look at old-time radio shows. Uh, Keep those comments coming, whether it's on our own Facebook page or on the Prisoner page. There's been some discussion of some of the things we've said there, and we really appreciate it. Uh, If you want to reach us by email, it's thechronicrift at gmail.com. Let's make sure I get that right as well. Uh, But until next time, thank you so much for listening. Until then, be seeing you, Jim. Be seeing you. have a cup of tea. Oh, hello again. Have you noticed the large role tea plays in this series? 
not just in this episode, but from the weekly opening scene where Magoon's thunderous resignation shatters a teacup, right through to the very last episode where tea is used to celebrate. A river of tea flows through this series. And what is it about breakfasts, too? Every time you turn around, some number two is offering breakfast to someone, most of whom wisely refuse his hospitality. Well, these are only minor observations, but by now we're probably all familiar with the more blatant symbols of the series. The umbrellas, the high-wheeler bicycle, Rover, the butler, and so on. While the tea theme can probably be attributed to the fact that this is a British series, these other symbols have been consciously woven into the fabric of the show to tell us something, either about the prisoner, the village, or about ourselves. Take the butler, for instance a mysterious midget who most often delivers the tea. He never speaks, although we're never told he's mute. That's just our assumption. His job is to serve the power, and he does so with admirable loyalty and efficiency. Perhaps he's supposed to represent the little person in society, the one whom the state theoretically exists to protect, but who, in this microcosm called the village, ends up serving the state instead. Or, perhaps the butler is number one. We get many clues to support this theory. Aside from the prisoner, the butler alone wears no badge and has no number, and he's always at the scene of significant action. And while we never hear him speak, we know number one only as a voice on the phone, a voice that never calls when the butler is around. Perhaps we've overlooked the butler, both figuratively and literally, as the prime candidate for number one. The final episode is full of clues to this effect, and it seems somehow to fit McGowan's dry British wit that, after 17 episodes of mystery and torture, we finally discover that the butler did it. Another fascinating symbolic character in this allegorical series is Rover, although it wasn't until the Schizoid Man episode did we learn that the great white village ball had a name. Rover. It reinforces what we've seen repeatedly this huge globe acting as a guard dog or watchdog of the village. But what is Rover made of? Is it biological or technological? Is it capable of independent thought and action? Does it drink tea? Well, we have some clues, but not many. We know that Rover resides at the bottom of the village bay, for instance, merging with the ground when not in use. We know it's activated by the control room, but how is it controlled? In Free For All, we see a very quick shot of a group of men sitting around Rover in a cave. Are they just observing it or controlling it? Could they be think tank engineers studying Rover to redesign it for increased efficiency? Or does Rover study men? In The Schizoid Man, we see more of Rover's functions and some of its limitations. It can be fooled, for instance, into chasing an empty moving car instead of its intended victim. Does Rover respond to motion? Is that why number two in the first episode orders the villagers to freeze when Rover appears? We also see that Rover can make mistakes. It identifies the wrong number six in Schizoid Man and accidentally kills him. But that's all we really know about Rover, except that it seems to act in direct proportion to the amount of resistance it meets. Like a Chinese finger puzzle, the more you struggle, the harder it is to get away. Because we viewers recognize Rover as a weather balloon, we assume it's hollow. But what if it's really solid, a lump of semi-intelligent protoplasm like a giant amoeba? This might explain its shape-shifting abilities, as well as its ability to withstand direct bullet hits without popping. And if this were the case, Rover could have some connection with the ever-present lava lamps in the village. They might be a reminder of the police power of Rover, or maybe even incubators for fetal rovers. The symbolism connected to rover is interesting too. White is usually associated with purity, and a circle or globe is usually a symbol of wholeness or perfection. In rover, these symbolic meanings are reversed. What appears good is evil. What appears harmless is deadly. In the village, even symbols aren't what they appear. But overanalyzing the symbology of rover might not count for much. Originally, Rover was supposed to be a little white car that would climb walls, skim the water, and herd people around. But the production crew just could not get the radio-controlled device to work properly. In its first scene, it ran right off the dock, fell into Port Merion Bay, and sank. 
The white weather balloon known as Rover was a brilliant last-minute substitution for the village police car. Next week, we'll roll in our high-wheeler bicycle to see what hidden meanings lie between its spokes. Until then, I'm Scott Appel, and I, I think I'll sneak another cup of number two's tea.